Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to lecture number 9 of CS317 Operating Systems. We continue with the chapter Threads. The fourth chapter of the William Stallings book is being used as reference for this topic. In the last lecture, we looked at thread states. We were introduced to the idea of synchronization and its relation to threads. We realized how RPCs can benefit from multi-threading. We explored user-level threads. We are continuing with the topic types of threads or different ways of implementation of threads. There are two types of threads, user level threads or ULTs and kernel level threads or KLTs. There are three ways in which threads are implemented and used. One way of implementing threads is by employing user level threads. Another approach is to implement kernel level threads. The third is a combined approach which implements both user and kernel level threads. In the previous lecture, we talked about ULT strategy. We noticed that the operating system does not know about ULTs because they are in the user space managed by the threads library. The operating system only knows the process and does not know that this process contains multiple flows of execution. We saw that the operating system schedules a process. The threads library schedules one of the ULTs of that process. We saw the advantages of this approach. We can run ULTs in any operating system, schedule them using any algorithm we like, and we can switch between two ULTs of the same process without operating system intervention. We also saw that if one of these ULTs sends an operating system service call, the operating system thinks that the process is making the operating system service call and the operating system blocks the whole process. We can use the technique of jacketing to prevent a ULT from blocking which will prevent our process from blocking. We saw that we cannot run two ULTs of the same process on different processors at the same time because the operating system gives one process to one processor only. After this revision, we move on to the other ways of thread implementation. Kernel level threads. In a pure KLT facility, all the work of thread management is done by the kernel. There is no thread management code in the application level simply an application programming interface or API to the kernel thread facility. An API is a library of functions. The system programmer uses functions from this library to create, destroy and run threads. Windows is an example of this approach. The kernel maintains context information for the process as a whole and for individual threads within the process. Scheduling by the kernel is done on a thread basis. This means that the dispatcher does not select a process, but it selects a particular thread within a process for execution on the processor. This approach overcomes the two principal drawbacks of the ULT approach. When a KLT executes a system call, only this thread blocks. All the other threads 
within this process remain unaffected as the operating system knows exactly who is asking for service. If a KLT blocks, another KLT within the same process can be selected. This reduces process switches. In a pure KLT strategy, a multi-threaded application can take advantage of multi-processing. The kernel can assign different threads of the same process to different processors at the same time. Therefore, many threads within a process can execute concurrently. Another advantage of the KLD approach is that kernel routines themselves can be multi-threaded. Since the OS knows how to create and destroy threads, processes of the OS can also contain threads. The principal disadvantage of the KLT approach compared to the ULT approach is that the transfer of control from one thread to another within the same process requires a mode switch to the kernel. Thread switching requires kernel mode privileges because all thread management data structures are within the address space of the operating system. Scheduling cannot be application specific. The same scheduling algorithm is used by the OS scheduler for all applications. KLTs can only run on an operating system that supports threads. This means that KLTs do not exist in old operating systems which were written before multi-threading came in vogue. KLTs exist in operating systems like Windows. Pause the video. Write your answer in a word file. Save it as my roll number underscore lecture underscore nine. Task number one. A process has three ULDs. All of them require operating system services. Will implementing the process with KLTs improve performance? Why or why not? Now let's look at the combined approach. Some operating systems provide a combined ULT-KLT facility. In a combined system, thread creation, the bulk of scheduling, and synchronization of threads within an application is looked after by the threads library in the user space. Multiple ULTs from a single application are mapped onto some smaller or equal number of KLTs. The operating system only sees the KLTs. When the operating system schedules a KLT, the threads library runs one of the ULTs mapped onto this KLT. In the figure shown here, Three ULTs are mapped to two KLTs. If any one KLT among the two on the left is run by the operating system, any of the three ULTs on the left can dynamically map to it and execute. However, the ULT on the right is hard bound to the KLT on the right. If the KLT on the right is run by the operating system, the only ULT mapped to it will execute. Mapping many ULTs to a KLT in the combined approach is a good idea because if one of them blocks, another can be mapped to the executing KLT and there is no need to switch the KLT. The programmer may adjust the number of KLTs for a particular application and processor 
to achieve the best overall results. In the combined approach, multiple threads within the same application can run in parallel on multiple processors and a blocking system call need not block the entire process. If properly designed, this approach should combine the advantages of the pure ULT and KLT approaches while minimizing the disadvantages. Solaris is a good example of an operating system using this combined approach. The current Solaris version limits the ULT-KLT relationship to be one-to-one. -one. Pause the video again and write the answer to task number two. Mapping XULTs on YKLTs in the combined approach is beneficial only when X is greater than or equal to Y. Comment. You have to tell me if you think this statement is true or false and you also have to give me the reason for your answer. Threads and processes can have four kinds of relationships between them. We looked at the single threaded approach. The single threaded approach is actually the one to one relationship between threads and processes. Each process contains a single flow of execution. Example is the Unix OS. We looked at the multi threaded approach which is actually the M is to one or many to one relationship between threads and processes. Each process contains multiple flows of execution or threads. Examples are Windows, Solaris, Linux, OS2, OS390 and Mac. But there are two more arrangements that we did not talk about. This is because these arrangements are evolving. One arrangement is one is to M or one to many in which one thread can belong to many processes. In this arrangement, a thread can migrate from one process to another process. Examples are raw kernel in the clouds operating system and the emerald operating system. Another arrangement is M is to N or many to many in which one process can have many threads and threads can migrate from one process to another. Example is the Trix operating system. Multi-threading, multi-processors and multi-core systems. With the passage of time, Two types of computer systems have evolved. They exhibit such good performance that they have become an essential part of our lives. One system is the multiprocessor, which has many processors on the same motherboard. The other system is the multi-core computer, which has many processors fabricated on the same chip. We now regularly work with systems in which multi cores are placed on the same motherboard to give a combination of both strategies. Why are these systems, the multi processors and the multi cores, so popular? The answer is simple. They employ and exploit parallelism or concurrency, the ability to do many things at the same time. If you remember, I showed you what concurrency is when we began threats. Another question that someone may put up would be, why is a system programming teacher talking about hardware architectures when dealing with threads? So far, we have seen that threads facilitate 
concurrent execution of events in uniprocessor systems. A very good example was the RPC calls example that we saw in the previous lecture. But when the system has more than one processors, the power of multi-threading magnifies. Multi-threading is the art of writing concurrent software. Multi-processing encompasses the techniques of concurrent execution in hardware. So when we bring concurrent coding strategies together with concurrent hardware, there is a great improvement in system performance. Three chapters of the William Stallings book are used here. Chapters 1, 2 and 4. We specifically use sections 1.8, 2.6 and 4.3. In the remaining of this lecture, I focus on multiprocessors. Multi-core systems will be the focus in the next lecture, inshallah. Now let us explore how threads are beneficial in multiprocessor systems. Multiprocessors A computer which has many processors on the same motherboard is called a multiprocessor system. All processors share the resources that interface with the motherboard. So they must share RAM cards, hard disks, other I.O. devices and buses. All processors are managed by the same operating system. Based on operating system design, multiprocessors can be categorized as master-slave systems, Symmetric Multiprocessors or SMPs Master-Slave Architecture Only one processor in the system executes the operating system. This processor is called the master. All other processors execute user applications. They are called slaves. The operating system for master-slave architecture does not differ greatly from that designed for a uniprocessor system. Can you say why? Think about it. The system has a performance bottleneck. Can you guess who? I told you that a performance bottleneck is a resource whose speed dictates the speed of the system. Even if you replace the whole system, as long as you do not speed up the bottleneck resource, system's performance remains low. So who is the bottleneck here? The master. You can have very sophisticated slaves running very fast, but the speed of the system will be dictated by the speed of the master. If the master is slow, the system cannot be fast. The system has a single point of failure. Single point of failure is that part of the system whose failure brings the whole system down. Can you find one thing in this system whose failure will shut the whole system down? The master. The beauty of master-slave architecture is you can use a uniprocessor operating system to run it. The problems are the system is slow and the system is not reliable because if the master fails, the system fails. This makes master-slave architecture a concept we do not implement anymore. Symmetric Multiprocessors or SMPs An SMP can be defined as a standalone computer system with the following characteristics. There are two or more similar processors of comparable capability. These processors share the same 
main memory and IO facilities and are interconnected by a bus or other internal connection scheme such that memory access time is approximately the same for each processor. All processors share access to IO devices either through the same channels or through different channels that provide paths to the same device. All processors can perform the same functions, hence the term symmetric. The system is controlled by an integrated operating system that provides interaction between processors and their processes. Any processor in the system can execute the operating system. Kernel modules can be run simultaneously on more than one processors. Look at this picture of a symmetric multiprocessor. There are multiple processors, each of which contains its own control unit, arithmetic logic unit, and registers. Each processor has access to a shared main memory and the I.O. devices through some form of interconnection mechanism. A shared bus is a common facility. The processors can communicate with each other through shared memory. The sending processor writes data in shared memory and the receiving processor reads it. The memory is often organized so that multiple simultaneous accesses to separate blocks of memory are possible. Memory is divided into modules. Two different processors can access two different memory modules to retrieve two different words of data at the same time. This is simultaneous memory access. In modern computers, processors generally have at least one level of cache memory that is private to them. The use of cache bridges the speed gap between processor and memory, improving performance. An SMP organization has several potential advantages over a uniprocessor organization, including the following. Performance If the work to be done by a computer can be organized so that some portions of the work can be done in parallel, then a system with multiple processors will yield greater performance than one with a single processor of the same type. Availability In a symmetric multiprocessor, because all processors can perform the same functions, the failure of a single processor does not halt the machine. Instead, the system can continue to function at reduced performance. Incremental growth A user can enhance the performance of a system by adding an additional processor. Scaling Vendors can offer a range of products with different prices and performance characteristics based on the number of processors configured in the system. The benefits we saw just now are potential rather than guaranteed benefits. So this means that a lot of system performance depends upon the operating system. The operating system must provide tools and functions to exploit the parallelism in an SMP system. An attractive feature of an SMP is that the existence of multiple processors is transparent to the user. The user normally does not know 
that there are more than one processors in its computer. Nor does he care, nor does he code his programs in a way to accommodate more processors. So everything about the processors is managed by the operating system. The operating system takes care of scheduling of tasks on individual processors and of synchronization among processors. Multi-threading and SMP are often discussed together, but the two are independent facilities. Even on a uniprocessor system, multi-threading is useful for structuring applications and kernel processes. Programs which are fashioned as independent threads are easier to debug and maintain. An SMP system is useful even for non-threaded processes because several processes can run in parallel. However, the two facilities complement each other and can be used effectively together. The same multi-threaded application can be distributed over multiple processors enhancing performance. In this section, we look at the considerations we will have to make if we sit down to design an operating system for symmetric multiprocessors. In an SMP system, the kernel can execute on any processor. And typically, each processor does self-scheduling from the pool of available processes or threads. The kernel can be constructed as multiple processes or multiple threads, allowing portions of the kernel to execute in parallel. Following are the challenges involved. The OS designer must consider scenarios involving shared resources like data structures. The OS designer must coordinate actions like simultaneous accesses of devices from multiple parts of the operating system executing at the same time. Techniques must be employed to resolve and synchronize claims to resources. An SMP operating system manages processor and other computer resources so that the user may view the system in the same fashion as a multi-programming uniprocessor system. A user may construct applications that use multiple processes or multiple threads within processes without regard to whether a single processor or multiple processors will be available. Thus, a multiprocessor operating system must provide all the functionality of a multi-programming system plus additional features to accommodate multiple processors. So the key issues in design of operating system for SMPs are simultaneous concurrent processes or threads, scheduling, synchronization, memory management, reliability and fault tolerance. Simultaneous concurrent processes or threads. A computer program or routine is described as reentrant if it can be safely called again before its previous invocation has been completed. That is, it can be safely executed concurrently. Normal functions are not reentrant. If one entity calls a function, another entity can call the same function only when the function has completely executed for the first entity. Writing re-entrant functions is a special coding strategy. If SMP kernel routines are coded normally, then two processors cannot call a kernel routine simultaneously. 
so one of them will have to wait and be idle. Therefore, kernel routines need to be re-entrant to allow several processors to execute the same kernel code simultaneously. With multiple processors executing the same or different parts of the kernel, kernel tables and management structures must be managed properly to avoid data corruption or invalid operations. Scheduling Any processor may perform scheduling, which complicates the task of enforcing a scheduling policy and assuring that scheduler data structures do not corrupt. If kernel level multi-threading is used, then multiple threads from the same process can be scheduled simultaneously on multiple processors. Synchronization With multiple active processes having potential access to shared memory or shared I.O. resources, care must be taken to provide effective synchronization. Synchronization is a facility that enforces mutual exclusion and event ordering. We have already discussed that synchronization means enforcing order. Mutual exclusion is a special order in which a resource is accessed by different users but one at a time. Mutual exclusion means giving access to one and excluding all the others. I will elaborate on this in the chapter relevant to synchronization. Memory management on a multiprocessor must deal with all the issues found on uniprocessor computers. In addition, the operating system needs to exploit the available hardware parallelism to achieve the best performance. What do I mean by available hardware parallelism? Well, hardware parallelism is present in the memory hierarchy which is shown here on the left. Data transfer between registers and cache does not need the system bus. So when data is being transferred between primary and secondary storage, a simultaneous transfer can take place between registers and cache. So two transfers take place in the time of one. This is available hardware parallelism. The paging mechanisms on different processors must be coordinated to enforce consistency. When several processors share a page or segment and to decide on page replacement. So when a page or segment is shared, we must take care that it is not replaced out of the RAM as long as any one processor has need of it. If a page contains garbage or invalid data, it should be labeled appropriately so that no processor mistakes it for actual data. Reliability and fault tolerance The operating system should provide graceful degradation in the face of processor failure. Graceful degradation is the condition in which failure of one or more system modules occurs, but the system does not shut down. Instead, the system keeps running with degraded performance. This is the opposite of a system containing a single point of failure which goes down instantly with the failure of one critical module. The scheduler and other portions of the OS must recognize the loss of a processor and restructure management tables accordingly. So the system must identify the processes which were scheduled on the processor that failed and reschedule them on the remaining processors. Lessons learned 
we explored kernel level threads we explored the combined approach to threads we talked in detail about symmetric multiprocessors we realized that smps and multi threading strengthen each other and we discussed the design issues of an operating system for smps customarily i leave you with the same to do list read the book keep the task file of this lecture with you and submit it when i open the assignment for this lecture in google classroom write your questions on a piece of paper and keep it in front of you during the online session if you have suggestions relevant to content or quality of this lecture email them to me congratulations you've completed 3 weeks of learning allah hafiz